Hello. So today we're going to talk about Suleiman al Bassam's play Ur. So this is a really interesting uh, play, not an adaptation necessarily, but inspired by uh, a text called The Lamentation for the Destruction of Ur, which is an ancient Sumerian poem. Um, lamenting the, the destruction of the city of Ur, as you, you might reasonably infer from the title. But it's also a postmodern, the uh, Ur, al Basam's Ur is also a postmodern play that threads together different time periods. So we have 2004 BC, or BCE, um, in the city of Ur, uh, ruled over by Ningal, who is a, a goddess um, and an aesthetic revolutionary. Then we have uh, 1903, uh, we have a German archaeological dig in the city of Ur, uh, where they're trying to find tablets, they're trying to piece together fragments, and specifically uh, some of the characters, especially um, Friedrich Dillich, uh, is attempting to prove that uh, Judaism is not the origin of Christianity, but that ancient Mesopotamia provides the roots of Christianity. And this is based out of uh, a deep anti-Semitism, which not all of his German colleagues share, interestingly enough. Um, and then we have, I think it's 2015, um, where, uh, yeah, uh, 2015, where um, Islamic State soldiers are blowing things up and uh, where they actually, uh, we have the, the death of Khalid al-Assad, uh, who was a... Um, a seriologist, a, a uh, I think he was a museum curator and things like that, and he was he was killed by the he was a real person who was killed by the Islamic State um, because he attempted to protect antiquities treasures, um, and then we have 2035, which uh, is set in a sort of futuristic city of Mosul, Iraq, we have a husband and wife. The, the, the 2015 and the 2035 scenes are really very minimal in the play, um, and, and so the majority of the time is spent either in uh, the German dig uh, in Babylon or in ancient Ur. So I want to first talk about um, the, the portion in ancient Ur, because this to me is the really fascinating bit. Um, so we have Ningal, uh, who again is the queen of Ur. Um, she is. Um, she is the wife of Nana, who's the god and uh, god of the moon and a deity of Ur. Uh, she is the daughter of Enlil, who's the god of the wind, um, and the niece of Enki, who's the god of water. Uh, so basically she's, she's a deity in her own right, but her primary function here is as queen. And she's this, again, aesthetic revolutionary, which is a figure I find so incredibly fascinating. Uh, she's a bit like Akhenaten, the, 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 the pharaoh of, of ancient Egypt who uh, ushered in monotheism and completely abandoned the existing capital to build a new capital, created an entirely new religious faith, and, and all this stuff. So Ningal is in the same vein, except rather than religious faith as such, she is interested in poetry to immortalize the city of Ur, and she's interested in freeing sexuality. So uh, we get this, at the beginning of Act Two, her priestess sings this song, 
which I'm not going to sing for you, but I'm, I'll, I'll read it for you. Ningal, Queen of Ur, decrees the following. Firstly, Ur is an open city. Secondly, Ur opens itself to any man, Sumerian, Obayad, Akkadian, or Elamite, who recites a poem worth inscribing, a song worthy of the lyre, or invents a tool that reduces the burden of human labor. Thirdly, Ur has seven doors. Each door is an orifice of, fe orifice of fecundity. Erotic poems are held in the highest esteem in Ur. Fourthly, the women of Ur are freed from their bonds, free to share their bodies without fear of sanction. Fifthly, priests of the false temples, those who abuse the defenseless widow, tax the dead for burial, and defile the orphan, are to be imprisoned, then banished forthwith, their income eliminated. Or as taxes shall be paid to scribes, not priests. So, she abolishes the army. She uh, abolishes the traditional priesthood. She takes a uh, an Elamite general as a lover, an Elamite general who was captured in battle. The Elamites are the the, the grand enemies of Ur in this play, um, and so. And, 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 and her whole thing becomes about basically inscribing erotic poetry. Um, poetry, I mean, poetry more broadly, but erotic poetry in particular. Um, and so what happens is that the city essentially collapses. So initially uh, what happens is that... Um, The Enlil, who is who again is is Ningal's father, um, initially besieges the city because he asserts that that they've that they've abandoned religious piety, um, and then later he he withdraws the siege and the Elamites invade. Um, and so we get this um, in in the beginning of Act Four. Uh, we have uh, a fairly lengthy speech by Ningal in which she addresses her people. Um, she talks about this this dream that she's had, this vision that she's had of the future, in which um, things are laid waste, people are are brutally killed, and so on and so on. And she says, if this dream be true and if this be the future, will you say that this is, this is what Ningal made? Ningal who raises the walls of Ur high to the heavens and keeps the doors to the city open. Ningal who frees the women of Sumer from bondage. Ningal who inscribes her city's glory onto the memory of the earth. My father's soldiers have gone. Ur is without protection. Within two turns of, a, of the sun, a second storm will be unleashed upon us more evil and more deadly than the first. Ur will be an empty city, a dead city. Do not tremble at this knowledge. Do not let your hearts sink with fear. There is nowhere to run. The gods have turned it against us, and Ur is called upon to fight. By dawn, my people, Ur needs one thousand poems for its scribes to pen. No sleep this night. We run to the future days, the coming days, the days that are not yet. They are our beloved children. They are our chambers, our gardens, our precious beads. Let them say of Ur that it was a city that raised its walls to the sky but kept its doors open. A city that did not fight with weapons but instead wrote poems of exquisite beauty and even when death lowered upon it, Ur raised its face to the sun and impregnated the, into clay the horror that devours it. Do not cry tyranny. What is, what is to come is harder to bear. What I dictate to you is the purest form of love. So she's got this idea of aesthetic immortality, that Ur becomes immortal through its poetry. And in some ways, this isn't necessarily that unusual a, a, a sentiment. Uh, we get this also in uh, in Shakespeare's sonnets, um, but what's what really kind of troubles this idea in the poem or in, in the play, sorry, in in Abbasam's play, is that 
um, we get these archaeological digs later on. And one of the things about them, um, as the, the, there's a guy named uh, Walter Andre, who's an, an illustrator and assistant at this archaeological dig. Um, one of the things that Andre says is, it is precisely through fragments that the ideal presents itself to the real. So the problem with Ningal's uh, theory, the problem with her, her aspiration to aesthetic immortality, is that it depends on later generations to have those texts, to read those texts, and to understand them. And, and we also get this same problem echoed with Khalid al-Assad um, later on, when he's we get a speech here that he's giving to um, da, 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 da. a lecture room. I don't. I don't. Uh, I don't think it says specifically what the the lecture is, but he's giving this lecture, um, and he talks about the difficulty of of working through Sumerian ruins, uh, through Sumerian texts, because of what we don't have. So he says, of the numerous Sumerian epics and myths, hymns and lamentations, proverbs and wisdom texts that have come down to us on tablets dating from the early post-Sumerian period, the great majority are in such a state of incompleteness that, although large portions of the composition can be pieced together from the various duplicating fragments, it is impossible to obtain a clear and satisfactory picture of their contents as a whole. For the serious translator of this material, this unfortunate fact amounts to a tragedy, for it robs him of, all, of an all-important element of control against slipping into a biased attitude in his interpretation of the individual passages. Um, and so this is the sort of idea, this is the sort of problem that we have explored in the play, one of the problems. Um, the, the problem of art explored in the play is can you inscribe meaning in an eternal way when that depends upon later people to read this? And the most overt example we have of sort of misreading of ancient texts is this idea uh, that Dielich, the German uh, philologist, has that Christianity has its roots in the ancient Mesopotamian, rather ancient Mesopotamia, rather than in uh, the Hebrew Bible, and this is actually the first thing we get in the play. He's giving a, a speech at the Deutsches Orient Gesellschaft, which I, I don't know exactly what that is, but it's sort of um, antiquarian group in Germany. So, uh, one of the things he says is, "Yes, gentlemen." For in the Babylonian dung heaps lie the true origins of our own religion. In Babylon, I say, not Israel. In Mesopotamia, I tell you, not the Old Testament. Science agrees with me, yet some continue to assert the moral superiority of Jewish monotheism over pagan polytheism. And why? The Ten Commandments? Hammurabi made them long before Moses. Noah's Ark? Tis Gilgamesh. Babylonian texts, lost for, millennia, for many millennia, now opened by our zealous eyes, reveal Moses' Pentateuch as little more than a jumbled assembly of inauthentic retellings and shoddy rewrites. These eyes unpick the signs, tap their mute forms, and open their sealed lips. Lift the veil, gentlemen, lift the veil and see how the evangelist granted to these, those Babylonian wise men, not, I tell you, not the self-proclaiming false latter-day prophets of the Israelites, to be the first to offer homage to the, at the cradle of Christianity. And so this is, inter this is interesting in itself, um, but one of the things that's more striking, and this connects with like Ningal's emancipation of, of, of sexuality, is that later in this speech, archeology span becomes this deeply sexualized thing. Um, like he says, under the flaring nostrils of our Kaiser, this mission seeks to address how it behooves the hand of German science to finger that dark mons of Babylon and revitalize the flesh of the Gospels that, as Goethe has already told you, glisten and gleam. 
Um, he also says, uh, he also describes their their discoveries as propelling the Babylonian wise men's semen deep into the flared nostrils of our father Wilhelm for Germany's tumescent glory. So it's kind of kind of weird, kind of sexualized, but it's also about misinterpreting the text based on your own bias because you're piecing together fragments to find the thing that you're looking for.